Thanks for joining us on this um, video worship service. I recently heard about a kindergarten teacher, and she decided that she was going to provide a lesson on self-esteem. And so she told the, the students that if you think you're dumb, I want you to stand. The idea was that, of course, nobody would stand, and then she would say, of course you're not dumb. You're smart. You're creative. You have lots of great ideas. You're important to your family. You're important to this class. But then Tommy stood, and she was kind of mortified. She said, Tommy, you don't really think you're dumb, do you? Tommy said, of course not. I don't think I'm dumb. But I didn't want you to be the only one standing. We are facing difficulties and trials that sometimes catch us off guard. We're not ready for them. We don't know what to do. And if we're not quick on our feet, sometimes we struggle with the crisis at hand. There are some people that love a crisis. They want to be there in the middle of the battlefield. They love it when the volcano is erupting. They, they like the um, avalanche that's coming down upon them. They want to be there when the difficult times come. But for the rest of us, um, we may have a tough time dealing with crises. We don't like the physical kind of response that comes over us when we're facing difficult times. And so you may search for some way to help you relax. You might stream uh, smooth jazz online. You could take a Zoom class, um, a judo class, or um, a, a, um, some relaxing kind of course that will help you, meditation. Uh, you might go to a physician and have... Um, uh, pills prescribed for you that help you to calm down. There are a lot of different ways that we try to deal with the stress and the, and the crisis that comes into our lives. Um, the Bible tells us that there are things that come up against us that are bigger than just natural causes, that there are supernatural forces that are working against us. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6 that, that Satan, that there are uh, spiritual forces of evil that bring things into our lives or, or cause us to disrupt, be disrupted. And, and so we are facing circumstances and situations than, that are bigger than our ability to comprehend sometimes. We don't have an easy solution to them. But the Bible promises, uh, promises us that, that God is available to us, that his resources are made, uh, are provided to us, and we have access to him at any given moment. Um, the Bible, is taught when it talks about what God has for us, one of the things that is described is that our feet being fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And it's a metaphor that is referring back to the Roman soldiers. They used to have special sandals. Uh, no other armies were equipped with this kind of um, the, with these kind of shoes. They had little knobs um, attached to the bottom of the sole. And so when the soldier was, when the Romans were going up against barbarians, say from France, they would be able to stand their ground. They weren't easily knocked off their feet because they were able to dig into the ground with those kind of like cleats that they had. And then also if they were attacking the enemy, they could get their footing and they could easily have traction and move forward uh, in their attack. So um, the Romans had an advantage in many of the battles where they fought. Oftentimes their enemy didn't even have shoes. So um, we also are told in the scripture that we have an advantage. We have the power and the resources of God available to us. And we have to decide what we're going to do about those resources. And we discover um, that there are crises that can be too big for us, that, that we don't know how to handle. Uh, a marriage that's starting to fall apart, a career that's collapsing, um, trouble with our children, um, an inability to make sense of the diabetes that we've just been diagnosed. We may have problems with our friends. Uh, we might find ourselves in a financial crisis and we don't have the means to get out from under it. There are all sorts of difficult circumstances that come up against us and we don't necessarily have the resources 
or how to deal with them. Um, in the scripture passage that, I, that I've referenced, we are told in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, to stand firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, there is a little word in that, in that verse the Greek um, word that is used there is translated in our text, readiness. Uh, you might also use the word alacrity, describing what God says, uh, how we are supposed to respond to these situations. And you, uh, you may say, well, what does alacrity mean? What's the definition of that? Um, that? That is a brisk and a cheerful response. It's a readiness that is ready to go. And so the Bible says that that when we come up against difficult circumstances, a crisis, one of the things that we have in our possession is this alacrity, this briskness, this readiness to go ahead and, and go up against it, to fight what we face, to battle with what we are up against. And there are plenty of people that they don't recognize that, that they are fighting against spiritual forces of evil, they may not even notice how big it really is, the crisis that they're encountering. They may not understand all the ramifications of what they're experiencing. And so they are not ready to gain the help that is necessary in dealing with what they have. They're not eager to go after what God wants to provide for them. And so they just kind of wait and they sit through it. There's, there's an interesting... Um, a little account in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Amaz, his, he was, his job was to be the messenger for King David. And so his responsibility was, if there was news that, that David needed to hear somewhere in the kingdom, then Amaz was to, to take that news to David, was run and, and bring that message to him. And so David's forces were fighting against the armies of um, his son Absalom. And David's army won the, won the battle, but also Absalom was killed in the battle. And so Amaz wanted to bring the news to David because that was his job. And, his, and the general Joab said, well, you shouldn't do that today because David's not going to be really pleased with the news. And, and so Joab sent another messenger ahead of Amaz. And Amaz just kept pushing Joab, let me go, let me bring the message, let me give him the news. And finally Joab said, okay, you can go. And so Amaz ran and, and ran as fast as he could to get to David, and he actually beat the other messenger who had started off before him. That's the kind of effort that we are to have when it comes to this matter of the crisis that we face and our response to what God has to offer us. I recently heard of a friend was describing how um, his house was in an uproar. They're tearing up the carpet. They're move, uh, the furniture is all moved around to try to get the um, carpet in place. Nothing is where it used to be. So it's very difficult to, um, to be able to find what you need. And, and so he was borrowing his son's um, keys, his, borrowing his son's car, truck, and he couldn't find the keys, and he was searching throughout the house. He opened drawers. He looked in counters. He looked in the closet. He, everywhere he looked, and it just grew more and more frustrating to him. And he was taking all sorts of time that he didn't really have to try to find the keys. Finally, he stopped, and he prayed, and he said, Lord, can you show me the keys? And instantly, he knew where the keys were. Sometimes we just wait longer than we should to seek out the resources that God has available to us rather than quickly with, with enthusiasm and with anticipation going to God and allowing him to, to, to take our problem on his own shoulders, we try to carry it. I love the account of Ruth. Ruth is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I was talking to my seminary class about her, and I said, you know, I, I love Ruth and her, her character and her personality that we see explained there. Well, Ruth was a young widow. She lost her husband and um, most widows, that was devastating for them, not just for the loss of their husband, which was terrible, but also financially uh, for their well-being because there were no jobs. There were no careers for women at that time. Um, there was no way to feed your family if you had little kids. Ruth didn't have any children yet, but she still had to provide for herself. 
And many widows would just try to find a man who would marry them. And it didn't matter who the man was. They need, just needed someone who would take her uh, under their roof. And some men would have uh, two or three wives. But that wasn't much of a life for a young widow like Ruth. But Ruth decided she, she would quickly go to God. And so she told her mother-in-law, Naomi, your God is going to be my God. I am going to worship him. I'm going to seek him. He is the one that's going to protect me. He is going to be my provider and my help. And Naomi said, well, why don't you just stay in, in, in Moab? I'm moving back to Israel, but this is your home. And Ruth said, no, I want your God to be my God. I'm going to go with you, and, if, and I'm going to have his protection, his wisdom, and his insight as I go. So the two of them moved to Israel. And not long after that, Ruth met Boaz, who became her husband. He was a wonderful man, generous and kind, um, also rich. And it was a perfect marriage. You would say a marriage built in heaven. How did she find Boaz? She didn't find him. God found him for her. And there are times where we have a crisis we have a circumstance, a situation, and we don't know what to do, and we don't see any way out of it. We're frustrated. We're disappointed. Maybe we're even upset with God because why did you allow this to happen? And despite the fact that the Bible tells us that there are spiritual forces that are up against us, we still may blame God for the circumstance where we find ourselves. And like, unlike Ruth, we may not go to God immediately with our problem. We may not trust in him to take care of the situation that we face. But Ruth, when she went to God, she discovered that God had a bigger plan for her. That, that God was taking her and moving her to a new place that she may be a part of the, the grand events that are in the kingdom of God. So Ruth and her husband Boaz, they had a son. That son had a son. And that son had a son who was David, the second king of Israel. And we know that out of the line of David came the Messiah, Jesus. So if Ruth had not trusted in the Lord and believed that even though this great crisis had come, she didn't decide that her life was devastated. She went, followed God, went to the new place that God had for her, and God built a life with her that was bigger and better than anything she could have imagined. Um, you might not know the account of Mark, but Mark, um, Mark wrote the gospel of Mark, but he's not really famous for anything except perhaps for his failure. Um, Mark was the cousin of Barnabas, one of the early leaders in the church. And Paul and Barnabas were convinced that God was leading them to go on a missionary trip. And so um, Paul, Barnabas said, why don't we take Mark with us? And Paul said, okay, that sounds great. I trust you and your judgment. And so Paul and Barnabas and Mark as a threesome, they went into various places and they started churches and they shared the gospel. But partway through the missionary trip, Mark decided that he didn't want to be with them anymore and he went back home. Well, you may say maybe there was a good reason for Mark leaving. Paul obviously didn't think so. And he was aggravated and, and frustrated by it. And when Paul and Barnabas returned, um, after a while, they became convinced again that God was leading them on a missionary journey once more. And Barnabas said, let's take Mark with us. And maybe he said, you know, Mark has changed. I, he thought through what he did, and he, you can count on him. He's loyal. Paul said, there's no way we're bringing Mark with us. I, I can't trust him. I can't count on him. When we needed him, he wasn't there. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to let Mark go with us. And so the disagreement between Mark, I mean, between Paul and Barnabas was so intense that they split up. Um, Paul took Silas and they went into one part of uh, one area for a missionary journey. Barnabas brought Mark, and some people say, speculate that he went into Cyprus and and that's where he, the two of them shared the gospel. H have you ever failed miserably? H have you ever 
found yourself where you were embarrassed by what you had done. I, I've been fired twice, and both times I was completely humiliated because it was kind of a public firing. Perhaps you realize that, you know, you didn't raise your kids right. Maybe you've made major mistakes in your marriage and you haven't lived up to all of what a marriage should be. Maybe you cost your company a significant amount of money because of a mistake you made. It could be your drug and alcohol addiction are an embarrassment to you. And you're frustrated by your inability to um, maintain sobriety. Maybe you did terribly on your SAT score and it's just confounded you because now you don't think that you can go to the college that you wanted and, and your future just looks kind of bleak. Um, maybe you made a mistake in a relationship and, and, the, and the relationship is blown up and you're wondering if there's any hope for you, um, what you had, had counted on as far as the future that you had now it's destroyed. What's fascinating about the account of Mark is that we don't know much about what transpired between when Mark and Barnabas went on their missionary journey and later in Paul's life. But Paul sent a letter. It's the second letter to Timothy. Sent a letter to Timothy. And he described what, how things were going. He was in prison. He was about to lose his his life. It's probably the last letter that Paul wrote. Um, he explained how certain people had abandoned him, how others had been a help to him. And he wanted Timothy to come and visit him in prison. He had something that he wanted Timothy to bring that was important to him. And he said to Timothy, when you come, I want you to bring Mark with me because I found him helpful in the ministry. What a transformation of a person's life. Where once they were a significant failure, and now they're the, the important person in the, someone like the great missionary's life, Paul. God is ready to transform a broken past into a glorious future. What seems to be the end of the line could be just the beginning to a destination that is tremendous and wonderful and where you stand out because of your faithfulness and your godliness and your willingness to follow the Lord. And so you can, have, you can find your failure back here and you can feel like there is no more hope for me. I, I'm never going to be able to make much of myself but when God becomes involved, then suddenly you will find that he, may have, he has a success for you, that you can become a success story. The, when the Bible talks about the, the, the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, many times we forget that part of the salvation that Jesus brings to us when he died on the cross Part of that salvation is that he brings to us peace, supernatural peace, the peace that comes from within him. Isaiah the prophet said that the coming Messiah would be the prince of peace. Jesus, in fact, said himself, as he was talking to the disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace that Christ has to offer you is not worldly peace. It's not peace that you can just, that you can receive a prescription or that you can figure out a way to attain it. It's a supernatural peace. It's a peace that comes from outside of you and is in placed within you. 
It's the peace of Jesus. It's the peace that he experienced when he was dying on the cross. It's the peace that he had when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the peace that he had when the storm was raging and everybody else was in a panic. The peace of Christ is what is offered to you. And you can decide, you know, I'm doing all right. I, I'm facing these battles. I'm fine. But perhaps you will come to the realization I can't handle this on my own. This tension, a headache that I have, it's too much. And the Lord says, you don't have to be lying awake at night worrying about your problems. That knot in your stomach doesn't have to exist. You can have the alacrity. You can have the speediness to come to me immediately when you feel the crisis hit. And I will provide for you my peace. I will insert it in you. I will give you what I possess, this calmness and this quietness of spirit. But if you wait, like many people do, then you suffer from all the consequences of that stress that is unnecessary. God wants to lift that burden from you. He wants to carry it. And even though you may say, well, I think I have a solution, what about having Christ's peace as that solution is being worked out? What about immediately running to him and letting his peace come over you? The account of Thomas in the New Testament is pretty fascinating. Now, we know him as Doubting Thomas. I don't like that moniker. I, I choose not to call him Doubting Thomas. He's just Thomas. And when the disciples were in the upper room and um, they were mourning the loss of Jesus, actually, they were also hearing reports that maybe Christ was alive. Thomas wasn't there. And, and we don't know why Thomas wasn't there. He, he may have been, and many people speculate this is the case, he may have been mourning the loss of Jesus. And, you know, some people, they just don't want to be with others when they're struggling, when they're suffering. They want to keep it to themselves. They, they want to, to, to weep alone. And perhaps that's the kind of person that Thomas was. He had given up everything to follow Jesus. Um, family and friends may have said, what are you doing? Why are you following this guy? And he said, I know he's the Messiah. He's the promised one. And then when he died, that whole, that all collapsed. The crisis of his life came upon him. Satan attacked him. The spiritual forces of evil came against him. And he didn't see any hope. There was no, there, there was no way out of this, this loss of Jesus. But then the disciples came to him and they said, Thomas, we met Jesus in the upper room. He came to us and he's alive. He's risen from the dead. And we touched him. We heard his voice. We were with him. And Thomas goes, there's no way that you saw Jesus, that Jesus came to you. He said, but it's true. And this is the fascinating part of the account. We only think of Thomas as doubting. But I want you to realize that there was a sliver of hope within Thomas that maybe it was true. It wasn't all feelings of it's ended. But there was a little bit within him that said, maybe Christ is alive. And the way we know this is because he was there the next week in the upper room. He may have been with the disciples the entire week, but at least we know that on Sunday evening, Thomas was there. And so when Thomas was up in the upper room, the disciples were there. We know the, the account Jesus came and, and he went to Thomas and he said, you can touch my, my wound in my side. You can touch the prints of the nails in my feet and hands. Consider this. Thomas had lost his opportunity because of his grief, because of his despair over what had happened. He had lost his opportunity to meet with Jesus, resurrected. Easter Sunday Thomas was by himself. 
The disciples experienced the celebration of meeting Jesus in the flesh, in new flesh, resurrection flesh. Thomas didn't experience it. But another Sunday, a future Sunday, Thomas had his time with Jesus. His victory moment arrived the next Sunday. For many of us, we are living on what everybody else is having, an Easter Sunday. Everything is going well for them on Easter Sunday. All their success, all, their, all the things that they hoped would work out, everything is going smoothly. It's Easter Sunday, and there's plenty of us who look at that and say, well, how come I can't have what they have? Now, I want you to consider this. For Thomas, his resurrection Sunday was next week. It was coming. The plans that God had for him were still being developed. Now, during this time, the lapse between Easter Sunday and Thomas' own resurrection Sunday, he needed something to carry him through that period of time. What he needed was the peace of Jesus that passes all understanding. Without the peace of Jesus, while you're going from the Easter Sunday to your resurrection Sunday, without the peace of Jesus, you have that knot that's in your stomach. You have that tension headache. You have that fear. You have, you have that oppression because Satan has really come against you and the forces of evil have really struck you. And the crisis that you face, the difficulty, the loss, all of that is real. And you feel lost on everybody else's Easter Sunday. That person that passed away, that job that ended, that marriage that's coming apart, those children that are lost and, and hopeless. Easter Sunday for everybody else is not your resurrection Sunday, but your resurrection Sunday is coming. And in the meantime, you need the peace of God that passes all understanding. See, God may be working out circumstances for your resurrection Sunday. There may be changes that have to happen in various people for your resurrection Sunday. There may be, have to be a job opening that comes for your resurrection Sunday. God may have to work certain circumstances in various people for the changes that happen that will bring about your resurrection Sunday. There are all sorts of things that God may be working out in the time between Easter Sunday and your resurrection Sunday. And you wait. And you wonder, is God with me? Will he help me? Will he bring about what he has promised in the scriptures? Your time is coming. Your resurrection Sunday is on its way. But you need his peace to carry you from everybody else's Easter Sunday to your resurrection Sunday. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would be with each person that's struggling, that's experiencing loss and hardship and difficulty, failure, shortcomings. They don't know what they're going to do with their life because things have just kind of fallen apart. Plans that they had made have collapsed. Relationships are kind of broken. Everything seems like it's out of whack. And we know that Satan has come up against them, that the forces of evil are attacking them. And they don't see a way out. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be the way out for them. I pray that your peace that passes all understanding would come into them, that they would receive you, every part of you, and the salvation that you bring. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Perhaps you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you'd like to have him as the one who gives you eternal life. The Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross to take our sins from us. That he rose from the dead and he has the power to give you eternal life. Your sins will be taken from you when you trust Jesus as the Savior of your life. So you simply go to him and you say, Jesus... I know that I've sinned against you. I don't deserve the forgiveness that you offer, but I know that you promise it.
and I trust you as my Savior and my Lord. From this point forward, I give my life to you. You take it, and you remake it. And Lord, you are the king of my life, and I thank you for this glorious salvation I have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us.